Welcome back to Origins 2018 here with Dragon's Demise. I'm sitting down with Jeff McClinsky of Strange Machine Games. Hello. Uh, they have agreed to talk to us. They have the, I believe they described it as non-exclusive rights to the Robotech franchise. So lots of board games, card games, all sorts of that coming out of them. Yeah, as well as... games, anything. Anything. Anything you can imagine. Anything, yeah, right. Uh, as well as some uh, original products and RPGs as well. Yeah. So thank you very much for yeah. sitting down with us. Great, thank you. We're yeah, sticking yeah. with the Jenga interview style. We've got three different colors. Blue is for games, their games specifically. Red is for the industry. Green is for wild card. I get to ask whatever I want. You know the drill by now. You want to push the first block? Ooh, very swift. Oh, don't forget to put it on top. Oh, right. we got to build that tower higher. Right, right, right. I haven't played Jenga in a while. Right. Uh, so you guys are sort of a board game publishing company. Yeah, uh, it's you, a movie called Baby Publishers. Baby Publishers. Brand okay. new. Brand new. So what, um, what has it been like breaking into the industry? So you know, finding designers, getting content out there. What's that been like? Well, so far, um, we have friends who are designers. Okay. So the games that are not Robotech based, we've gone to our friends for. Um, and then sort of worked with them to get the games where they need to be, you know, for where we feel they need to be from, from um, a playability, from a presentability standpoint. Absolutely. You know, marketability and stuff like that. Um, the Robotech stuff is everything, it's all us. Okay. You know, except for one Robotech game that we're doing with a partner. So it's really, it's really his Robotech game, but um, he's basically piggybacking our license. Sure, okay. So yeah, it's, it's, we have our name on it, but it's really his game. Okay. Yeah. But you've got designers in-house for those types of things? Well, we have a really good support group in Maryland, uh, playtesting group, and there's a lot. There's a lot in Maryland, DC area that really support us with the playtesting, and they're all designers, so they're all looking to pitch. Actually, we just we were just meeting with one. I was running right, right. What I was doing right before I ran here was to, talking to one of them, a guy named Franklin, and he's here, running around pitching everything he's got. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. All right, my turn. Let's go. Blue for games. Oh, uh oh. Got it. Uh, so with the Robotech series, uh, you mentioned you've got three games coming out with that. You've got one that was sort of designed uh, by another person who's working with you guys. Yes, yes. Uh, but Steve Cole. Steve Cole. Uh, Escape Velocity Games. Uh, but the the two that you sort of developed in house, yeah. uh, you've got one that was being described as to me as a much faster paced game. It's coffee uh, table. Real time, yeah. twenty minute play time, mm -hmm. give or take. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. You've got sort of a spinner in the middle. Quick oh, reflex. Oh, yes. So, so the one with the spinner, that's Brace for Impact. That plays up to 15, 15 players. Okay. Uh, it has a soundtrack. There's actually multiple soundtracks. Easy, medium, and hard. Yeah. We even got, we, we believe we have Melanie McQueen on board to do the voiceover for the soundtrack. Now, okay. she is the voice of Lisa Hayes on Robotech. That's, that would be pretty impressive as a get. Right. Yes. So we're really excited for the game. It's really crazy. Basically, it's a calm response game. The GM is doing things based on audio prompts. Okay. And he's trying to kill you. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to stay alive. And by killing you, I mean he's damaging the SDF-1, damaging the spaceship you're in, damaging the, the SDF-1. In Robotech terms, is the massive spaceship that the aliens are trying to capture. Sure. And This is all really helpful for me. I know nothing about the Robotech <laughs> right, franchise. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. And a lot, so a lot of people do, but a lot of people don't. And so this is, you know, it's always good to good time to talk about Robotech because we, we love it so much. Yeah. But um, you play as a bridge crew, and if ships are surrounding you, you need to blow them up. So if someone says, hey, we need to fire these lasers. That's the emergency. And the command, the response is somebody else, not me, like you would say, fire those lasers. Okay. And you then see if you destroy the ship. There's a little mechanic for that. You do a spinner, you, you, know, you add the points up. Do I, do I blow it up? Do I not blow it up? The thing is, there are ships that are way too powerful for just a single shot to destroy. Sure. So somebody could say, oh, we revealed this this really powerful ship, somebody else will scream, um, you know, all hands open fire. Okay. And when you hear that, that's a prompt to just start throwing your damage onto the ship to see okay. if you have enough to destroy it. So you've kind of got to work together. It's very, yes. not just cooperative, but also something, you know, a very call and response. Yes. A, almost like a real bridge crew. Yeah, almost like a real bridge crew. And the thing is, is that, oh, by the way, you're not just getting surrounded by ships, you're losing life support. Your armor is going down. Your structure is going down. If you lose your structure, you die. You blow up. Okay. If you lose life, life support is almost like your populations, your support. 
so you don't have crews to help you repair. Okay. Yeah, but there's a lot of things you do. You scan ships, and everybody's doing stuff to try and keep that thing alive. Awesome. It's really frenetic, but also sort of like, like controlled chaos. Yeah. And it's not really like a game like we've seen out there. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. And there is a non-soundtrack option as well. Sure. So. Okay. Uh, I think it's your block. Oh, okay. So you mentioned, you know, you've got this really great support network on, yep. you know, you guys are local to Baltimore. Right. Uh, you know, on the mid-Atlantic coast, working with designers, great opportunity to get in there. Um, what about, have you received any support from other publishers, just in terms of whether that's encouragement or, uh, you know, what's been your experience like just breaking into the business with yeah. other publishers? So we had a really tough time as distributors. You know, we got Robotech and we thought, Somebody is going to want this. You know, we made this really cool tower defense, you know, story driven tower defense co op game thing. Yeah. And we're like, hey, distributors are going to love it. And we really got a lot of um, pushback. Really? So, yeah, no one, distributors were not open. Now, I think we maybe could have, at least the big, the big three or four weren't so open. We probably could have pushed it down the line, but then you start taking a hit on, you know, your, your, um, the, the amount of percentage that they were able to take. Absolutely. And at some point, you can't cover the cost of manufacture if you go too low. So luckily, you know, we, we by going to PAX Unplugged, which is a great convention, we love it as well as Origins, it's been great. Um, we met up with Eric Price of Global Games Distribution and Japan Anime Games. Sure. And he's like, hey, hey, listen, I have a network in place. I can get you, get this thing out there for you. So we're doing what I'm sort of calling piggyback publishing, where we are publishing with another publisher. They're okay. a partner, but they're an older company, an established company that has distribution capabilities. And that has been our biggest support. And really, we, we didn't just want to start the Kickstarter grind, yeah. where we got to put out 10 games before anyone cares about us, and then maybe you can start talking about distribution. We, so we bought into Robotech as, as, a, as a launching pad. And I believe it was a great idea. Yeah, no, um, I mean, certainly you've got a sort of a built-in fan base. Right. Um, that you can you can launch from, yeah, literally. Yeah, it's built-in fan base, plus people who aren't fans will still, you know, if it's a good game, they'll, they'll approach it. Exactly. Yeah. Great. All right, back to me, back to me. Let's get a green, let's go crazy. Okay. Go nope, crazy not that cheese green. Whiz. Not that green. Jeez, whole, why are these so hard? Heard in a whole All right, here we go. thing on Django. It's really actually pretty interesting. Really? The pieces I, are specifically made not to be even. I was noticing that as we've been setting it up. And it's really I thought hard it was just do. faulty. Anyway, yeah. uh, all right, so we got a green here. Yeah. One of the things we've been asking people, sure. uh, what's your favorite game that you didn't design? But for you guys, what's your favorite game that you didn't publish? Um, favorite game that we didn't publish, that, we haven't, that we're not like anticipating publishing? Yeah, sorry, that, yeah. that was published by someone else. There we go, That's that you nice. weren't yeah, involved yeah, yeah. with. Um, so, I know it's ridiculous, it's an old game, but I really like Citadels. Okay. Classic. <laughs> it's not right. I mean not afraid to yeah, yeah put it out there. It's you know got some flaws to it, but I, I like it a lot, you know, and I like Evolution, I think. Okay. Um, uh, Mag Blast. Okay. I know. don't know if I'm familiar with that one. It's older. They've had some different versions of it, like Mag sure, like sure. Mag Blast, you know. I really like I don't I I spend a lot of time working, so I don't have time to play. <laughs> Oh, that's such a shame. Because like, you know, I mean, I'm sure design. you love board games. That's why you got into this, I bet. But I, well, I have a degree in design. I'm an industrial designer by degree. I love creation. I need, and I, I need outlets to. Okay. You know, I need craft, craft-based output. So, like at one point, I built my own custom water cooled computer. And when I say built it, I mean I literally welded aluminum to build the frame. Dang. Of the, yeah, and I use CAD. Yeah. I, I also have like tiles, like dungeon tiles, like Dwarven Forge stuff. And I've spent you know hundreds of hours building a modular shipping CAD that yeah. you know you can change sizes, and I bring a prototype to it to, to run my games at like Gen Con for it. Sure. And it's just like you know I just need those kind of things. So um, I played enough games you know to understand board game mechanics. Yeah, yeah, I played absolutely. board games at friends, so I like to design them. But um, I really probably spend more time doing role playing games. Interesting. So, okay, so. great. And talk about a pivot. If you want to take a blue. But oh, okay. don't let me don't let me pressure you. Take right. whatever color you like. All right. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go the easy route. Yeah. Okay. That guy's that guy's G money. All right. Let's see. <laughs> I can't see, so I'm going by. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Same time, trying to save the mic. There you go. 
Uh, so you mentioned Kickstarter, uh, yeah, sure. which is great because I know you know one of the things that we consistently hear people mention is that Kickstarter has been very disruptive and not in a bad way necessarily. It's just changed the game really for how games make it to market. Yeah. And so you all, as I, I mean, you're certainly the youngest publishing company that I have any experience with or knowledge of. Yeah. What has it been like, sort of coming onto the scene since what you could describe as the Kickstarter revolution? Right. So. Um being, being in a customization, mass customization space, I think about this stuff a lot. So one of the advanced technologies, or one of the, it, it's integrated with Kickstarter is this other ability to do stuff. Okay. So it's almost like the making scene, right? And what we have here, and what Kickstarter is, and what, what we're really burgeoning into is, is the new technology that allows us to make. And so you talk about 3D, when you think making, people immediately go to 3D printers. But when I say make, you're talking about, you're talking about processing. Right. You're, right. you're talking about producing. So uh, digital files, digital information, um, email, you know, uh, learning new languages, mm -hmm. you know, the accelerated ability to learn new languages. Right. So you have all these like, external factors that are forcing this concept of mass customization. And really, you know, it used to be you were going to make a board game, you, gotta, you had to buy at least 10,000 copies, 5,000 copies minimum. Sure. And you needed to go to Toys R Us and to, you know, all the stores in the malls because malls were a thing back then, right? <laughs> and it was a grind. So now what happens is we can just spam stuff and we don't have to do 5,000 copies. Now we're still stuck at 500 copies or we're stuck at, you know, if you're doing casting molding, you could do 50 to 150, whatever. You can do one-off stuff. Right. But the real revolution is going to come, the really disruptive revolution is going to come when I can go out and get a high quality game made for $20 each and I can make 50 copies. So we're in that process of getting to that point, maybe that's in 10 years, maybe that's in 100 years, right. but we're already, it's already happening. Right? 5,000 copies down to 500 copies right. that you can make money on, you can produce, and Kickstarter is leveraging that. Kickstarter exists because of these other external factors and the fact that anyone can make a game. Right. Wow, that is a much, that's a very academic answer. I'm glad we, we talked to you. Well, I have you, a degree in I'm design. Kidding. Yeah, so. <laughs> exactly, no, you're bringing this, you're, you're bringing us all up. You're bringing right. the quality of the content up. Yeah, yeah. So. quality content. <laughs> uh, let's do, all right, I am gonna get one of those blues. Sure the quality of your content is well sufficient. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. All right, uh, so you mentioned RPGs. Sure as sort of one of your preferred things, and I know yeah. that you all actually do have a couple of RPGs yes. in your wheelhouse. Uh, age games, so Age Past. Yeah, it's I not know. part of the Age system, it's its own thing. Okay. Age Past system, yep. Uh, age Past, and then also a new one coming out, Super Age? Super Age, right. Super Age. Yeah, which just funded a week ago, or whatever. Congratulations. A Friday ago or something, yeah. yeah. So I'm still waiting for the money to come in and well, get going, right, yeah. Cool, uh, Thanks, so yeah, what are, what are those like, uh, in terms of setting, in terms of system, well, wherever you want to go? RPGs are hard because there's the elevator pitch, and I'm not, I'm not a showman, so I don't have a great elevator pitch. But what I work with is integrative designs. So when you talk about integration design, you're talking about how the characters integrate with the story, how the player integrates with the character, how the player interacts with the story, how the world interacts with the player and the characters. Okay. And so it's really awesome. about, yes, yeah, it's all that stuff. It's really about agency. So for example, one of the things I did is I made what I believe is a fairly adaptive gear system. All the gear is on their character sheet. All the gear has points. Okay. It's abstract between size and weight, okay. and um, you just track how much gear you have. Because no system really tracks gear, but we want to track gear. We, the GM wants to say, hey, you lost your heavy blanket, now you're freezing. Right. But it never happens because the ability to integrate with the system isn't there. Hmm. You know, it's like, it's like having a button on your car you can't reach. Sure. Well, if you can't reach it, you're never going to use it. Interesting. So by having the gear available, and the GM could be like, oh, you're running from trolls and you, you, you know, fumble a roll, your gear pack rips open and you lose 15 gear points of stuff. Okay, so now, it's this sort of abstraction that just represents yeah. generally what your character has access to and how that right. affects their, their performance. So I follow a Venn, a Venn design process that involves um, what I call procedure or mechanics. Yeah. Then it's modeling or abstraction. How do you, what actually happens? And then there's a cinematic what is really going on, okay. cinematic or semantics, how do we understand it, what's really going on, and right. a really true good RPG sits in that bend. 
Right. And the middle. Now, board games are just purely mechanical. And narrative story-driven games, they're on the cinematic side. So if you're going to take procedures and integrate them into your, into your game from a design standpoint, you want to make sure that you're able to let the player know what he can do. That's a sem semantics factor. Right. I understand that this does this because I understand words and understand how role-playing games work. Right. And then when I do something, this is what happens. So an extension of this would be I kick someone down. Well, first of all, I get a, I get a procedure for kicking someone down. I get my mind's eye and the abstraction that I kick someone down, they fall down. Sure, the visual of it. Now that they're down, they're at a penalty. So they're sort of fumbling around on the ground. That's sort of cinematic. My buddy comes up and stabs the guy because he's on the ground. Mm -hmm. So you get this cyclical process, and that's how my games work. Okay. They focus on player agency and the ability for you to integrate into the story in a way that's meaningful to how you want to play the game. Nice. Very ambitious. Also, very well articulated. Again, loving this. <laughs> loving this right here. I'm at a, I'm at like a college lecture. <laughs> think about things. <laughs> uh, no, that's great. We love it. Yeah. Go ahead. It is my turn. It is. Uh, this guy should be easy because he's counterbalanced. Bam. Okay. Uh, the RPGs, so we mentioned yeah. uh, Age Pass and Super Age. Yes. One of the other things that I noticed uh, was something called the Charm 26 system. Yes, Charm. Is that you? Yes. Okay, and that's, so it seems pretty innovative. You've got a D20 yes. really at the core of things, but yes. also a D6 yes. that you can flex and sort of declare, yes. hey, I want to add this D6 to my roll after yes. you've seen the results, yes. as I gather. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but you have to explain it. Okay. So. Once it gets integrated, so the purpose of the system is you roll a die 20 and you get a result. But you get these points, and you can spend these points to re-roll. Um, or you can spend points to add the die 6 in. Right. And the game is set up to work on a very basic system of, of three. Okay. So, for example, something trivial, you don't have to roll, it's trivial. Something easy is a zero to three. Something that's moderate is a three to six. Okay. I know, I know. Sure. Now, you notice that there's a, the threes, 18 to 21, but a die 20 only rolls a 20. Right. So how do you get above a 20? So you roll the die six, you take one of your special points and add it in. Okay. Now these special points I'm talking about in the charm system, it's made as a generic system to replicate anything any general simulation system will do. Okay. Okay, the way this works is you have your genre. Pick a genre. Uh, let's go pirates. Pirates. So we expect what pirates can do. Are these magical super pirates? Are these space pirates? Just regular pirates. Historically accurate pirates? There you go. Historically accurate pirates. So now we have the genre knocked down. Right? It took a second, right? So now we all know we're playing historically accurate pirates. Now, we, that might, we might have different ideas of what that means, but that's what the GM's for. Right. To settle us out. So then you say, what kind of pirate are you? Uh, I am a, I'm a terrible pirate. Uh, not terrible as in bad, but terrible as in ruthless. You're a ruthless pirate. Yes. So that is your archetype. Ruthless okay. pirate, right? And I might be like uh, the suave pirate, right? Sure. I'm getting the Love ladies. It. The Cary Grant. The bad boy, the bad boy pirate, right? But we're all pirating together. Right. So now we have our archetypes. So now you can pick a nature. Okay. Uh, well, ruthless is a little bit of a nature, but let's say yeah, sure. uh, diligent. Diligent, right? And I might pick um, unwavering. Okay. Okay. Now you get to pick three words. These are called aspects. Three words that describe your pirate. Okay, um, are we talking physical? Are we talking, okay, uh, let's. The classic. word should make your pirate be good at what it, you want it to do. Okay, at what you want it to do. Um, let's go uh, crack shot, um, let's go perceptive, um, and let's say standoffish. Standoffish. Okay. So now you put those in order. We'll just say you did them in order. Yeah. Your first one gets four points. Your second one gets three points. Your third one gets two points. Okay. Now anytime you can say my crack shot means something, you take a point away and you can re-roll, or you can invoke a power. Okay. So for example, uh, you you're you're fighting. You're surrounded. What uh, do you do? Let's see if I can identify that there's maybe a commander behind the guys that are surrounding and me. And how do you identify them? Uh, my, with my perception. There you go. Uh, and then I'm going to use that crack shot. So you can't use. So at first level you can't use two points. Oh, okay. At second level you can. Too ambitious. Well, second level you can. You got to build up. Okay. So you use these words to do what you want your pirate to do. Interesting. And that is the entire character sheet. There's also gear, but gear is meant to be built in. 
So if you're the crack shot pirate, you're assumed to have multiple pistols and an arquebus or whatever they use. Yeah. And you know, you're just assumed to have it. Okay. Right. I'm the suave pirate, so I probably have a rose on me. Right? Yeah. Right. So your gear is so, intrinsic and everything just works. Right. And it's all very, you know, sort of narrative driven in the sense of you want to take these keywords and you're not necessarily relying on, oh, do I happen to have this exact feat or skill that enables it? But just it's wherever you want. This is reasonably within my character. It's reasonably within your character. Okay. So and that allows you to reroll. So, hey, I missed my shop. I'm a crack shot. So you reroll. Or, hey, I got that 18. My six die six is showing a five. 18 plus five is 23. I, now I'm doing something superhuman because I'm above my 20. Okay. So now you employ your, you do that and you can just, you go off. You're basically the next level above. You're not a normal historically accurate pirate anymore. Right. You're now a superhuman pirate. Right. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Charm 26 that system a, in a nutshell. That was a little character sheet. That, you, that was your character sheet. Fits awesome. on business card. I can, I'm ready to play. Let's, yeah. all right, we're, so we're gonna, we're gonna end this. Okay, great. We're gonna go play. I'm just yeah. kidding. All right, all right. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's see. Let's get. Maybe we will we end go it. For this one. Yeah. So it's counterbalanced here. That one should be open. Oh, wait. There's one right here. Yeah, sure. There you go. Bam. Problem solved. All right. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite animal? My spirit animal is red panda. Red panda, good choice. I also love the, gray white sharks. The adorableness and the the goofiness, or what? Just it's just close to your heart. I can't, you know. I mean, it's just a spirit thing. I mean, I think if we use more words to describe it, it only sullies it. Yeah. We should use less words. Okay. All yeah. Right. But Red I love gray white sharks. And gray white sharks. I, I love scuba diving. I love sea turtles and dogs and cats and all the animals. Red pandas, yeah, all the animals. Red panda, spirit animal. Red panda, that's the one, number one. Yeah. Okay. You have a spirit animal. Uh, I have long said penguin. Really? That's yeah. a good one. What kind? Um, not an emperor penguin. Certainly not like one of the ones that. Yeah, they're I'm, the most thinking, northern of the penguins. That's true. That's true. And I, I do find that the cold uh, is unpleasant. So maybe yeah. northernmost yeah. Like is it. what we're gonna like it, go yeah. for. All right, there we go. Uh, go for one more. I think probably we've got last time. Want? I'm. Mean, it's all up to you, man. I talk a lot. So you do well, but that's that's the whole point. I'm interviewing you. Remember, you're involved in this. But. Yeah. All right. Industry question. So we'll end Industry. on this. Yeah, yeah, sure. You guys are. You, you call yourself babies. Baby uh, publishers. Fledgling. You're Baby brand new. Aw. You're cute. Let's call it five years. Yeah. Where do you want to be? Where do you hope to be? Well, I don't know. I mean, we just want to be, I think, I think minimum, we want to be taken seriously. We want to be able to put a game out. We want to be able to go to a publisher and say, hey, this is a good game. And you know that because we only make we good games. So. Yeah. And you should carry it. And they say, okay. Yeah, that's sort of like the minimum goal. Now, the maximum goal is that, you know, I can do this full time or quit my job or part time even, you know. Right. Um, but really for us, it's about making good games. You know, I don't, you know, but to do that requires a lot of pieces, including it me does. taking it seriously, including being able to run Kickstarters, including being able to work with publishers, to be able to work with distributors. Okay. So, yeah. Well, there you go. Well, I wish you the best of luck in Thank that five so year plan. Uh, Appreciate you. We can't me. end the interview without having this knocked over. You want to do the, do the honors? I don't know. I'm. Go for it, man. I'll tell, tell you what, I'll tell you what. There you go. All right, good enough. Good enough. Jeff McClinsky, thank, thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, Strange Machine Games, check out all of their stuff. They've got it online. Uh, Robotech, independent IPs, RPGs, you name it. Well worth checking out. Thanks so much for joining, and we'll Take see care. you with continuing coverage.